بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we see we are in the last جمعة of the year and as is customary according to Westerners, according to people in America, they celebrate the New Year's. Right? And as we know in Islam, Rasulullah tells us that we have two Eids. And Eid is the day of celebration. We only have two Eids. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha. So we don't really celebrate New Year's. However, one thing we can take away because in another hadith, Rasulullah says, Al-Hikmatu Dalatu Mu'min. Wisdom is the lost item of the believer. Anywhere where you can find wisdom, be the person Muslim or not, if it is nothing contrary to your beliefs, you can take a wisdom from someone. You can read a book that a non-Muslim wrote. You can take wisdom from many places. So one wisdom, which is part of celebrating the new year, we don't do all of the celebrations and and the fireworks and parties, etc. However, what we can do from there what we can take is the concept of a resolution. And this should be done all the time for a believer. Renewing your ambitions, your desires, your goals to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can utilize this as well. As a believer, you can make a New Year's resolution if it helps you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because it's a new year and we have to do it as a new year. But something inside ourselves understands that a new chapter is starting, a previous chapter has closed, and this causes some type of desire within ourselves to better ourselves. We take stock of ourselves, we look at where we are, the goals that we have made last year, how much of those have we fulfilled, perhaps we surpassed those, but oftentimes we find ourselves lacking in that regard. Whatever goals I made, I usually fall short of that. And that's not a problem. If you make high goals for yourself, inshallah, you will be able to accomplish a lot, even if you don't meet that. So we can take that, inshallah, and we should utilize this time as we transition into 2024 to start thinking about where I am. As a Muslim, as a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as an individual, and as a member of the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is my position? And how can I strengthen that position with my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with my fellow Muslims, with my family, and with myself. So we should all use this time for that reflection. Now I want to focus today on sinning, right? Disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why we do it, what it does to us, how we can avoid it, because this is one of the greatest resolutions that you and I can have. We all, in terms of our relationship with Allah, the first thing we think about is, you know, if I want to get close to Allah, we start thinking about things that we can do. Perform tahajjud salah, perform five times salah, in jama'ah, sunan, fasting Mondays, Thursdays, reciting this much Qur'an, this much adhkar. That's where the mind goes when we start thinking about a resolution, about getting closer to Allah. However, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us the importance of abstaining from sin is more important than nawafil. Of course, we have the fara'id, the compulsory acts that you must complete on a daily basis. One of them is the salah we're going to perform, inshallah. It's compulsory. So those absolutely we must do. However, when the mind starts thinking about how I can get closer to Allah, we start thinking about extra acts of worship. Whereas we are told what we should be thinking about is how I can cut out the garbage in my life. The extra useless things that I am committing on a daily basis, how can I remove that? How can I detox? So that the the power of the ibadah is actually more beneficial for me. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made compulsory for you is actually the best way to get closer to Allah. Five times salah, fasting Ramadan, giving the zakah, A very simple life. However, we pollute that effect by committing sin. If only you and I can abstain from sin and just do what is compulsory, we would be very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And this is what I am proposing should be our New Year's resolution, inshallah. That we start cutting out the unnecessary sins from our life. Not adding in extra ibadat. If you want to do that, uh, alhamdulillah, please. By all means, go ahead and do that. You want to perform Salatul Tahajjud, great. You want to give extra amount in sadaqat, charity, zakat, excellent. You want to help people, that's great. But something that is compulsory is that we avoid the sins. And this is because there are very various harms, a great deal of harm that we do to ourselves. And as we shall see, inshallah, that we do to others by sinning. Yes, sinning is not limited to yourselves. We actually harm other people when we sin. In one hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states, يُوشَكُ أَن تَتَدَاعَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْأُمَمُ كَمَا تَتَدَاعَ الْأَكْلَةُ إِلَىٰ قَسْعَتِهَا Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba, in the future, not right now, in the future, there will come a time where people will take you as bite sizes. They, they will start taking away from the ummah. They will harm you and you will be completely defenseless just like a person takes a luqma and a bite from a plate and it's very easy. There's no repercussions. You have a plate of food in front of you. You eat wherever you like. Take from close, that's the sunnah. Take from far, no one's going to say anything. Eat whatever you like, no one's going to stop you. Rasulullah told us one day will come where enemies of deen, of Islam, of Rasulullah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come and pick you up and take you away with zero repercussions. No one's going to say a thing. This is what we're seeing in today's time. Very apt hadith. And this is a prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahaba asked, min qillatin nahnu yawma idhin ya Rasulullah? Are we going to be few in number? That's why. Maybe there's only a thousand believers. So if someone takes one believer away, the rest, they're kind of defenseless. They can't really do anything. One thousand against a hundred thousand. Is that the case, Rasulullah? Allah, absolutely not. That is not the case, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. You're not going to be few. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ كَثِيرٌ You're going to be a lot. There's going to be so many of you. More than you could even fathom. How many Muslims in today's world? Over a billion Muslims. Never before have we seen these numbers. However, this prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very clear before our eyes. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ غُثَاء كَغُثَاء إِسَيْنِ You are going to be the leftover. Just like when there's a flood and there's some material that is left behind on the flood, when a flood comes and it's dirt and it's filth, you're going to be like that. You're going to be worthless, basically. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, the reason why your enemies will come and pick you up like a certain luqma, a, a bite off of a plate with zero repercussions, with no one on your side and you being unable to do anything is because your value in the sight of Allah is going to be low that day. You're going to be a great amount. One day, it is such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the, your fear in the hearts of your enemies. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the mahaba, the awe, the grandeur, the fear that an enemy has for their enemy, that will be removed from the hearts. Oh, Muslims, are just a Muslim. It's a nobody. We can easily pick on them. We can easily harm them. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is prophesizing a day when our enemies will not fear us anymore. And in your hearts there will be wahan, there will be weakness that comes. The, the hearts of the believers will be filled with weakness. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, قِيلَ وَمَا الْوَهْنُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Sahaba said, what is this weakness? What are you referring to, O Messenger of Allah, that has afflicted the hearts of the believers, which is the reason why the enemies have no fear for the believers? قَالَ حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَاهِيَةُ الْمَوْتِ Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says two things. Love of dunya, that will penetrate your hearts, and the fear and the dislike of death. This is our condition in today's time. We love the dunya and we fear that we're going to part from the dunya. This love of the dunya, hankering after it, chasing after its wealth and its beauties and its luxuries is what is causing the weakness in the ummah. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying, he's given us the solution. If you want the reverse, you don't want this anymore. You have to take these out. 
And he's talking to every single individual amongst us And he's talking to us as a whole The entire ummah itself is in this state How can you and I rectify this condition? This state? We work on ourselves We remove this from our heart We realize in one hadith Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa states Tuhbatul mu'minil maut The gift of the believer is death But in this hadith he's saying that One day will come where you will dislike this gift Allah is giving you a gift. You can now meet me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us by death. And we're saying, no Allah, I don't want to meet you. This is our condition. We're scared of dying. What is there to fear? Our brothers and sisters in Gaza, they're asking for mouth. They realize that this is the way out. This is how I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way I leave this horrible dunya behind. Because they've seen the reality. You and I, were still chasing after it. We're still hankering after this dunya. And this is the cause that Rasulullah states. In another hadith, Rasulullah says, إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرَعْ وَتَبِعْتُمْ أَذْنَابَ الْبَقَرِ وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ سَلَّطَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلًّا لَا يَنْزِعُهُ عَنْكُمْ حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى دِينِكُمْ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states, this is in Musnad Ahmad, as well as Sunan Abi Dawood, the Sahih Sanad. Narrated by Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma. He says, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, When you start engaging in ina, which is a riba transaction, you start doing transactions in riba, usury, interest, etc. And you are happy with your gardens. You start planting, you start working and in, in today's time, our careers. You start becoming happy and content with your careers and you, you focus only on that. And you start following the tales of cows, meaning you become a herder, you're trying to grow your wealth, your concern is regarding wealth. And you no longer strive in the cause of Allah. You no longer go in the path of Allah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is prophesizing. In the time of the Sahaba, they would engage. What happens when this happens? This is, he's basically saying, he's painting the picture that you're going to love the dunya and you're going to fear death. You're not going to strive for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. What happens then? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cast over you such a dhul and such a humiliation and embarrassment. La yanzi'uhu ankum. He will not remove it from you. You will be embarrassed. You will be humiliated before the world until you come back to your deen. This is the solution Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving us. We can state many different solutions that you and I can engage in. This is the primary solution, the primary one. I'm not saying this is the only thing that we can do. Of course, there's many things we can do. But we need to come back to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the medication. Personally, for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, and for the globe. As an ummah, we can strengthen the ummah. Don't think that I am just an individual. What can I do? You are going to be a king in the akhirah, inshallah. If Allah gave you iman, and he's going to give you death with iman, inshallah, that means you're a king. In the akhirah, or a queen in the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you that. You are not insignificant. One individual can change everything. One individual's dua, when you're making a dua, you're calling upon who? The creator of the heavens and the earth. He can answer every single individual as he wishes. He hears every single person. He sees every single person. You make a dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can answer that. You're not insignificant. If we can rectify ourselves, we can stop the sinning. We can engage in learning our deen. We can get closer to Allah. We can help the poor. We can engage in society in the proper manner. Then this is the promise. And inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give rectification to the ummah on condition that we ourselves rectify ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Believers, these so-called believers will not be true believers until they resort to Rasulullah for their answers, for their problems. When you and I have a problem, who do we go to first? Do we look in the Quran, in the Sunnah? Do we look at Islam? Do we ask imams and scholars, what is the Islamic method to this problem that I have? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you don't do that, you are not a true believer yet. Yes, you have iman, you have the shahadatain. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. If you die like this, inshallah, you will be a believer. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you don't have true iman yet. If your primary resort is to go to 
other sources other than Allah and His Rasul. This is not true Iman. In another hadith, or rather an ayah, Surah Ra'ad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمْ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change a condition of a people until they begin the first step. They decide that I want to change. What does this, this ayah mean? Allah will not change you until you change yourself. Isn't it then just you changing yourself? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that ultimately change comes from Allah. Allah is the one that will give you that tawfiq. Don't think that I am the one who is doing this. I was capable of removing this sin from my life. I am the one who is coming to the masjid. I am the one that recited this much Quran. This will create a level of pride and arrogance in our hearts that I am something and you start looking down on others. Rather understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gave you the tawfiq. However, when does that tawfiq come? When you make the intention. When you intend that I want to change my life, I want to remove this sin, I want to engage in this ibadah, I want to help this individual, I want to rectify myself, my family, my society, then Allah will give you that tawfiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the state of a people until they decide to change it themselves. Then Allah will create the means for us. Many of us haven't even made that decision. Many of us have, have not even decided that all of the missed salahs that I've done throughout my life, how many thousands are there? Did I even note it down? Did I even make the intention that I'm going to do the qada, the, the, the redo of those prayers? How many times have I missed a fard fast of Ramadan? Did I make those up? Do I even know how many there are? If I have not performed my hajj, am I making preparations for that? At least have a year in mind. 2030. That's an intention. Is that even there? We, has to, we have to ask ourselves these questions because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us He will not change us until we make that decision to change. Once you make that decision, inshallah, Allah will make it easy for you. He'll give you the tawfiq. Now, as I was mentioning, the, the greatest thing that you and I can do, the best resolution for this coming year is to cut out some sins from our lives. Whatever form these sins can be in, and sins come in various forms. There, is, there are sins of the limbs. Rasulullah ﷺ in one hadith, in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim narrated by Abu Huraira, Nabi ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ عَلَى ابْنِ آدَمْ حَظَّهُ مِنَ الزِّنَا أَدْرَكَ ذَلِكَ لَا مَحَالَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, He knows which actions you are going to do, which is sinful, which is a type of zina. Now Nabi ﷺ in this, this hadith, He tells us, that zina or fornication is not just of the actual act itself. Anything that leads to it is a sin as well. This includes misusage of the eyes, the ears, and the tongue. All of these are part of zina as well, which means they're a sin. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah knows exactly what you're going to do. Don't think he's unaware. He's letting you do that. And he's, he wants you to turn to him. But zina al-ayn al nazar the zina of the eyes is to look at haram. How much haram are you and I looking at? The zina of the tongue is to say something that is impermissible. How often are we engaging in this? When nafsu tamanna wa tashtahid, the nafs, the desires, it, it wants and it keeps on wanting and it keeps on sinning. And finally, when a person goes to the ultimate limit, they do the actual act of zina itself. So all of these are considered part of the zina. So we learn from this hadith that all of these acts, even if I look towards haram, that is a sin. Even if you don't intend on doing it. Meaning you don't intend on doing the act, but you are intentionally looking at haram. If you unintentionally look at something, that is forgiven. There's other kinds of sins, transactions, dealings with people. Rasulullah states, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ آكِلَ الرِّبَا وَمُوكِلَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهِ وَكَاتِبَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses the one who consumes riba, interest, Allah curses. Not you and I, not even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La'an Allah. Allah curses this person. Who consumes riba, who takes or receives, and the person who is documenting the riba. All of those, the middlemen in between. And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa also says, مَا ظَهَرَ فِي قَوْمٍ الرِّبَى وَالزِّنَى إِلَّا أَحَلُّوا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ عِقَابَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ 
any time a group of people are involved in riba and zina. So the sin of transactions, the sin of lusts and desires. When a group of people, meaning a community, when they are engaged in this, meaning when this is rampant, our society today, he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cast upon them a type of punishment. There's a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these ahadith, he's just describing our, our society today. You just look at these ahadith that are talking about Yawm al-Qiyamah, you see it'll fit every single character trait that we have. Very unfortunate. What can you and I do? We can take some steps to decrease this. There are certain things that we can't avoid. It's just the system of life. We can make dua to Allah to not count us among them. We can do istighfar on a daily basis. And that is why there's some people, they don't know why they're doing istighfar. You know, I, I don't feel like I sin. Why, why do I need to do a hundred istighfar on a daily basis? Your existence in this country, in this world at this moment is a sin. So the fact that we're engaged in our every single facet, dealing with a bank, dealing with all of these things, we can't get away from it. These are all sins. Why we should add on to the list of istighfar. And scholars state that if you don't know which sin you're committing, that is a double sin because... Not only are you committing a sin, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that all of the children of Adam commit sins. But you're also ignorant of it. You don't even know what sin you're doing. So we need to do even more istighfar. So that, that, that sins of the limbs, sins of even transactions that we're engaged in perhaps. Then there's sins of the mind as well, the mind and the heart. Looking down on people, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he states, بِحَسْبِ مِرِئِمْ مِنَ الشَّرْ أَنْ يَحْقِرَ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمِ this is in Sahih Muslim. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states that this is a really bad thing that you look down on another believer. You look down on another person thinking that you're better than them. This is an egregious sin, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states. In another hadith, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر. A person cannot enter Jannah if they even have a atom's amount of takabbur, arrogance, and pride in their heart. Now what will happen? You know, we all have this level of arrogance. We have to try our best to decrease that. Do istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hope that Allah forgives. Allah can forgive it. But if Allah doesn't forgive, then a person with an Adam's amount of arrogance in their heart, they won't enter Jannah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says. So the only way you and I can enter Jannah is through the forgiveness of Allah. If he overlooks these actions. There's plenty to make istighfar for. In another narration, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, a person actually came to Rasulullah sallallahu He says, Wallahi la yaghfirullahu li fulan. Person said, or rather Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is telling a story to the Sahaba. This is recorded in Sahih Muslim. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa tells the Sahaba of a person. He says, Wallahi, by Allah, he takes an oath. Allah won't forgive that person. Some guy, perhaps he's involved in drinking wine, doing zina, doing the worst type, stealing, cursing people. So another Muslim, he says, by Allah, he takes an oath in the name of Allah, this person won't be forgiven. Are we doing this? Do we, do we make these types of statements about people? I don't know how this person will enter done. This person going to hell. Do we say these kind of things? We have to be very careful. Why? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then says, Allah states, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَتَأَلَّ عَلَيَّ لَا أَغْفِرَ لِفُلَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who dares take an oath in my name that I won't forgive someone? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it doesn't matter this, but what it, the sin this person is involved in. Allah says, who dares take my name and say that I won't forgive? You are a hakim and a judge over Allah? Inni qad ghafartu lahu. I forgave him. I already forgave him. Wa ahbatu amalak. And I destroyed your, your deeds. What deeds you have, your, your Sawm, Salah, Hajj, Umrah, it's gone. Don't expect to see that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. As for that person who you were pointing at, you were looking down at, you were belittling, I've forgiven them. They will find all of those sins gone on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is the sin of the mind, the sin of the heart that we're engaged in. These are the things that we need to rectify. These are the things that we need to pay attention to. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah in his Sahih, he has a chapter, Kufrun Duna Kufrin. Very interesting. And scholars, they speak about this at length. A kufr which is not kufr. Kufr disbelief. Disbelief which is not disbelief. Then what is it? 
Imam Bukhari has a chapter and he has various hadith regarding that. But commentators, they state why Imam Bukhari is presenting this is because you will see many people stating that this is an act of disbelief. You cannot claim that the person doing it is a disbeliever. But he also points us towards another fact. And that is every single sin that you and I do is a miniature kufr. It's not the major kufr. Major kufr means this person is not a Muslim. They've denied Allah, they've denied Rasulullah They're not a Muslim. That's a kafir. Someone who's done major kufr. But every act of insolence and disobedience to Allah is a miniature kufr. And we see this clearly in those ahadith where Rasulullah says, I fear for you a shirkul asghar. I fear for you, shirk, the minor shirk. And he clearly explains to the Sahaba when they grew in numbers that I'm not afraid you're going to leave Islam. Islam is very beautiful. Anyone who's tasted the halawa of Iman, they will not leave Islam. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells them, I don't fear that you're going to leave Islam. Inshallah, it's here to stay. What I do fear for you is the minor shirk, minor polytheism, which is showing off. You perform salah so that this person may see it. You recite beautifully so that this person may hear it. You give this much in charity so that you may be known. This is a type of shirk because we do ibadah only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one worthy of worship. And when we put in our intention some type of glorification of another individual, we've done a minor shirk. This person is still a Muslim. It's a minor shirk. You're getting close to it. So from this we can glean that every act of disobedience is a minor level of kufr. How? Because when you do that act and you're reminded of Allah and yet you still do that act, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is belittled in your eyes. He's not that great. If the greatness of Allah was true in our hearts and in our minds, we would be overwhelmed. How can I, how can I dare do this sin? Either we're forgetting completely at that moment of Allah, which is a sin itself, we should be cognizant of Allah. Or... This just doesn't matter to me. My desires are more important to me at this moment than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Imam al-Bukhari is alluding to. It's a kufr which is not kufr. It's not kufr. But it is a type of the essence itself is what is found in kufr. And that is belittling the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His azama, his grandeur and, and honor in our hearts is not that great. So these are things that we need to work on. The new year is coming. These are various things. I'll finish with this uh, one hadith, inshallah. It's a story that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam painted to us. And it, it shows us the effect of our sins. That when you and I sin, we're, we're causing a global damage to the ummah. Because you are part of that ummah. If a part of your car is getting messed up, you need to change that transmission. The entire car is going to be affected. It's not going to do its job. So when you, which are a portion of the ummah of Rasulullah وسلم, you're not doing your job, the entire ummah is going to be affected. Now what is this beautiful mathal, this parable that Nabi وسلم makes? He says, the example of a people who are committing sin whilst others are not caring about them. This is what Nabi وسلم is telling us. Some people in the ummah are committing sin and others are letting them do that. And from this, I'm going to draw a lesson, inshallah, that when we commit the sin, we are affecting everyone. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says there is a boat, a very large boat. And it has two layers. You have the upper deck and the lower deck of the boat. You have a group of people, those with the, who paid more, they get to be on top. Those who paid less, they're on the bottom. He just says, you know, there's two groups, one on top, one on the bottom. So the group on the bottom, whenever they would get thirsty and... Of course, in this example, they're on fresh water. They would go to the people in the top. They would say, we need some water. Can you give us some water? So they would give them a barrel of water, whatever. They have an unlimited supply. So the people would take it down. They would consume the water. When it's done, they would do it again. After a while, they notice we're going over and over to the people on top and we're bothering them. So what do they decide? They said, oh, there's a solution. Someone among them, some genius, he said, let's poke a hole in the bottom of the ship. So unlimited amount of water is going to come out. We don't need to bother them on top anymore. So now Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if the people on top, they know about this. They're aware. Every time they come up, they say, okay, we don't need any more water. We got a solution. We're about to do this. We're about to put in, instate this solution. We're going to make a borehole, the bottom of the, the ship. 
Now they have this knowledge. If they don't stop them, they too on the top, they're not engaged in this foolish action, they will be harmed. That entire ship will sink. Just because the action of maybe one or two down there. Rasulullah is basically saying, we need to do amar bil ma'roof nahiyan il munkar. If you see something wrong happening, you have to stand up, you have to say something for your own sake, for the sake of the ummah. Also, are we the ones boring the hole? That's what you and I are doing. We're the ones that made this idea, hey, let's go ahead and sin. Because the people there up on the top of the boat, they're getting water in the proper manner. This is the proper manner, following the deen of Islam, the proper way to live your life. The people in the bottom, they don't know how to live their life. They don't know what to do. They don't have any hidayah. They're going to puncture a hole in that ship and cause damage to everyone. Most of us are in this category. We are the ones that are making that hole right now. And people throughout the world are being harmed through our negligence and our foolish actions. But Rasulullah says, for those people on top, they need to warn us. And the people in the bottom, us, we need to take that warning. We need to realize that what we're doing, our sins, our personal sins, the sin that no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you know, the sin that you do when you turn off the lights and no one is watching and you're all alone, that is causing damage to the world. In this hadith, we understand this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq for a New Year's resolution just to decrease the sins of our lives. You don't have to do tahajjud. You don't have to do all this. It's good, alhamdulillah, please do it. But you have to stop the sins. It is harming the ummah. And this is one thing that you and I can do to help our brothers and sisters throughout the world. We have the capability and we have the luxuries. We're the ones that are sinning. Those people in Gaza, they're sinning. They're praying tahajjud. They don't even have water to do wudu. What sin are they doing? These people are shuhada. We're over here doing the sins. So when we're advocating, this is part of advocacy that I stop these sins. This is a huge part of it. And the solution that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is giving us. So if you want to advocate, let's start here and let's do that as well. So we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for tawfiq. Give us this tawfiq to make this resolution and be firm on it. And he is the giver of the tawfiq. Wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala ala khayr khalqihi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rahmatika ya ahma rahmin.